Welcome back, everyone, to our final session at this Linton Forum has been, I think, well presented and well received. I thank Amy and Alex and Elaine and Lori and Mike for making the tech available. Um, I think it's been mentioned, but all of these sessions have been recorded, and so we will make them available on our website following so that people can access this information after this is over. And I would draw your attention, we do have a survey that we'd love for you to fill out, and it is on the table outside in the fellowship space. And these are questions about what didn't get answered. What would you like to know more about? We'd really appreciate uh, you taking the time to fill this out. And um, at the end of today's session, we do have a guest with us today. We have Becky Davis from Natural Burial, who will be presenting. And then I'll be presenting on church funerals and the columbarium. And so at the end of our time today, we are going to walk to the fellowship space so that if you have any further questions of us, we can let this space be quiet and uh, observe the silence and the music that Elaine will be providing for us at the time of our time. So um, I think those are the announcements that I have. Roger so back. So for our last uh, closing spiritual practice, hopefully everyone has a little rock. And those of you on Zoom, we apologize for not getting you rocks, but you might be able to find one just outside your door. Um, does everyone have one? Is anyone missing a rock? Some are blank. Some have bases. You need one. They're in your hand. There's a pile of them back here. On the table, on the back table. Some are blank, and some have little faces on them. That's simply because I ran out of the blank ones, and I was using the faces for a work project. But it'll work just fine. Um, the, your your invitation is to think of one word that represents what you're wanting to leave behind. See if you can narrow it down to one word or a phrase. But what is it you're wanting to leave behind? That can be for your family, that can be for the world, your community. And then write it on the rock, we'll pass it on Sharpies. We also have some paint pens if you want to get a little more creative. But just write your one word on the rock. And then my invitation is to actually leave the rock somewhere outside for someone to find. So a mini practice in <laughs> passing on and letting go and leaving that thing behind. So we'll give you a minute to think about your word or phrase and we'll pass it on some Sharpies. And if you have one with a little face, you can fill in the eyes to make it fun. <laughs> We won't open it up for too much sharing, just for we want to prioritize time for our speakers. But I'd love to hear if anyone wants to share. We can start with the Zoom poll. Is there anyone on Zoom who has a word they intend to put on a rock? We've got two in the chat box God connections and compassion. Anyone else want to share what they thought of? What you're hoping, your one thing you're hoping to leave behind at the end of the day, it all goes down. Music. Music. Joy. Joy. Kindness. Kindness. Peace. Peace. Respect. Okay. Zest. 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 Good. Great. I love it. So. Sometimes this week, find a place to leave your rock. Someone will hopefully find it and give just a little piece of that gift that your uh, your intention is to pass on. So, thank you all. We'll turn it over to our speakers. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about church funeral planning and the columbarium that we have, which is right outside um, in our view. Um, but I start first with a story because. My experience of planning funerals comes from personal experience of having to bury both of my parents in my 20s with my sister. And uh, my, I think I've told many of you that they had short periods from diagnosis to death, and yet we made the most of it that time. And so we had three months from the time my mother was diagnosed until she died. I took a leave of absence from my job and with my sister and father were able to care for her. And during that three month period, occasionally my mother would say something like, I wanna be buried in a pine box, or I want the hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus to be sung at my funeral, 
or if you feel comfortable, I would love for you to speak. So we would jot those notes down and um, the time came where she died. She was a hospice nurse and we had hospice come in to take care of her. And yet even us aware of how important hospice is waited until the very last minute uh, to call them in because of the recognition of what it means that death is imminent. I wish we would have called earlier, but um, we did call in the end. Um, so it came time to plan her funeral. And we had a relationship with the pastor at the local Presbyterian church, strong relationship actually. So when we began to make our funeral requests known, there was a lot of openness, a lot of flexibility that we were allowed uh, in creating the kind of service that we felt would honor uh, my mother and give thanks to God for her life. And uh, thankful for that pastor who allowed for that. When we encountered the funeral industry, it was not the same. That was 30 years ago, though, and I know lots has changed, and Becky will be sharing some of the changes that have occurred, but when we began to share some of our desires for a pine box, the funeral director said, you don't want a pine box for your loved one, and my father said, oh, yes, we do, and we've already hired the carpenter to make the pine box, and um, my father also wanted a very tangible um, connection for the people present so that he asked to throw dirt into the hole where my mother's pine box was. And the funeral director said, no, we can't do that because it's too close to the hole. The liability is too much for us. My father was a rebel. He kept pushing. He did not accept no for an answer. And people were able to throw dirt into the hole uh, at the end of the day. There was also another uh, upcharge, I mean, some would consider it this, to take the coffin, the pine box that we had provided from the funeral home to the cemetery. And my sister happened to be dating a guy with a truck. <laughs> <laughs> and he, my father kept pushing. He said, do we have to pay for this? And uh, they said, well, actually, no, if you have your own transportation. My father said, we in fact do. And so that is what we did. And so we, we, we had the opportunity to make the funeral arrangements and also um, the plans at the church uh, with a lot of flexibility, although it took a little more pressure uh, to work with the funeral industry, but those things were, were done in the end. Um, and we, I wanted to ask Alex if she would share just a little bit about her mother's funeral and personalizing, uh, give an example of what can be done. Yeah, so we also work with a really flexible Presbyterian pastor and church that me and my mom loved her and were open to our wild ideas. So we tried a giant, uh, my mom loved roots. She would pull the car off the side of the road anytime she saw one sticking out and would just want to touch the tree roots. She was obsessed with roots. And so we found, cool story how we found it, but we found a, a giant root ball from a landscaper that we dragged onto the altar and had as part of the centerpiece for the service. And then we, my dad and I went into the, her plot in the community garden and dug up her now dead garden and found a bunch of tiny roots mm -hmm. that we passed out as a, just a really kind of tangible form of, of her ongoing love for everyone who was at that service. So I still have my little roots here. But it was, um, it's still, the, the ability for us to get creative was kind of my healing process for that service. Thanks for sharing that, so because I had such a good experience of the pastor being flexible when we were planning my mother's funeral, I want to be that kind of pastor. So um, as long as I'm at St. Paul's, I want you to know that you do have that flexibility. Um, those of you who have uh, participated in an Episcopal service know that there is a burial rite in the Book of Common Prayer. And um, Betsy is passing these uh, pieces of information, this uh, form to fill out. Um, we have some of these on file for some of you uh, that have made your funeral plans already. And so that when it comes time, this is such a gift to your own family to have all of these plans already created, the scriptures that you might like, the poetry that you might like, the hymns that you might like. If you want communion, if you don't want communion, do you want friends and family to provide eulogies, or would you prefer only to have a homily? These are the kinds of questions that go into planning 
uh, a church funeral. So um, we have, like I said, several of these on file. And if you would like to have yours on file, I would be happy to meet with you and help make some of these decisions. Uh, some people have also asked about honorariums. Um, I tell you as your pastor, there is no cost for me. That is my job. Um, however, if there is music provided, we have an honorarium for the musician. And um, sometimes if there is a reception afterwards, um, there's some costs associated with that. In addition to that, I wanted to hand out um, the columbarium pamphlet that Lori has just recently put together that I mentioned is right behind many of you with a lot of work from this congregation, Rhoda Robinson leading. We now have two um, columbarium that has niches within it where ashes can be placed. And on the back page, you'll see the cost associated with having a reserving a spot in the columbarium. An individual niche costs a thousand dollars, and then a second individual added to that niche is two hundred and fifty dollars. And then we also have a common crypt where the ashes are commingled with everyone else. And some of you know that Father Bacon's ashes are in the common crypt. And when we dedicated the columbarium, we took all of the ashes from the old St. Paul's church site and we put them into the new common crypt uh, and dedicated them was not long ago. So there's information about the columbarium. Yeah, yeah. Um, another way that this can really be a gift to the family, if you are a person that wants a church funeral, but you have children that are not a part of a faith community, that would be really hard for them to make decisions on your behalf. So having this document done ahead of time is really helpful to everyone. So I'm happy to meet with you at any time. I uh, would love to do that and get creative and let you know that you have a lot more options than you might think you have. Can we give you a little? Oh, sure. Becky Davis is my new best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Chatted for a good hour or so the other day, but um, I got to know the natural funeral when I was working at hospice. Their original location is in Lafayette, and I just fell in love with the creative potential of the services that they provide and the idea that your 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 funeral, your burial, whatever that looks like can really be a gift, not just to your family, but to the earth. And so I'm excited for her to share about options that are available, not just in the natural funeral in a lot of places, but there, there are options that you might not know about that you have. And then I also am enamored of the natural funeral itself. And I have a new Larimer County location too. So really excited to welcome Becky here to walk you through some of that as well as what it can look like and a little bit ahead of time, uh, if you're wanting to do that. But thanks. Yeah, I agree about the new best friend um, <laughs> thing. We had a great, a great conversation. So um, I have some slides. Oh, that is our team. So that is the natural funeral team. And I am the general manager of the uh, Loveland location. <laughs> um, but this team, uh, we are available for each other in all the locations. Um, so they're fantastic. I can work for a better, uh, a better, with a better group of people for sure. So I have a background in end of life and death care work, both in Texas, you might be able to tell, um, and now in Colorado. And I'm thrilled um, to work with the natural funeral. Um, so we are expanding our services around the globe. So that's super exciting. Um, by the end of the year, we'll have a location also in Denver and one in Portland, Oregon. So, um, so we're growing and we're excited about it and mainly excited about letting people know that there are other options out there, um, that you're not just restricted to options for what you want to happen with your body after you die. Um, so that's our team. So on the next slide, I was gonna tell you about um, something that we do that is a little bit outside the traditional um, or the, 
don't know what the right word is, regular <laughs> the funeral industry, typical, that's good, yes. Um, but, and it goes right along with what Felicia was saying about just options. And so we are passionate about allowing families to do what they want to do. And so how can we help make that, how can we help make that happen? And so one of the things that we have started doing, uh, we've been doing since the beginning is reverent body care. And so this is a way for families to participate in the care of the actual body rather than it going into the funeral home and then they take it away and they do whatever, all the things and then bring it back for the service. Um, this is a way for the family to participate in that, which is, um, I have seen several of these and they are really precious and sacred and um, everybody does it different and we can be as involved or as not involved as the family would like. Um, so the next slide shows just a picture of a reverent body care. This is not an actual dead person. This is a member of our board. She's a lot of um, But we can do reverent body care anywhere. So it can be in the home. It can be under willow trees. Um, it can be in one of our chapels, in one of our locations. But we uh, we drape the body in silks. There's fresh flowers. There's it's, it's a beautiful um, you can touch the body, wash the hands, wash the face, stroke the hair, tell stories, cry, laugh. Um, it's it's a really beautiful time, and there are often children involved, which is also kind of beautiful to be held the innocence and in, in innocence of a child. Um, so, so it's a wonderful thing. Um, so the next slide just is a little bit more of a technical um, thing of that there are there is another burial option. Um, so a standard burial is with a casket inside a concrete vault set down in a in a uh, hole, you know, about six feet deep. Um, then the a natural burial is where the body is placed in a pine box or a bamboo a bamboo casket, a willow tray um, wrapped in a shroud, any of those things in place um, three to four feet deep um, without any concrete liner. So the and the terrain around a green burial or a natural burial is just like you would just like you would see right out here, you know, just a mountain or uh, depending on where you bury. Um, it's just the regular natural terrain, so it's beautiful. Um, and the next slide shows just the next how gorgeous it can be. Um, beautiful. You can have a ritual at the gravesite. It can be a ceremony of your choosing. Um, we often have pastors, priests come and do the ceremony. We often have do them ourselves or the family does them themselves. So the next slide shows another. Um, that's we have a green cemetery, a green burial cemetery in Lyons, and that is a picture from that cemetery. Lovely. And there's a hiking trail right there. So it's beautiful. And then the next one is, and that's what uh, we have also a carpenter that makes pine boxes for us. There is one, and then there is a burial with a shroud. Family and friends can throw in organic materials, whatever they want to put it, the love notes, flowers. Um, we had a, a gentleman that died and he had a brewery. And so there was hops and people poured canned <laughs> beer. In. So it was, it was really cool. It was really fun. Kind of a fun way to honor him. Also pretty unique and creative. So, um, so the next, um, the point is, it can be the way you want it to be, um, rather than the way someone tells you it has to be. So then the next slide um, talks about, I was, uh, since, since 19, since 2015, fire cremation has become the most popular death care practice. Oh, that's not fire cremation. That's another ceremony. <laughs> Just another, uh, another view of another option. 
beautiful. Look at the background. <laughs> Here we are on flight information. <laughs> um, it's become the most popular death care practice, but as cremation, which often burns fossil fuels like natural gas, becomes more commonplace, a lot of people are more concerned about its effect on the environment long term. And so in the next slide, we were, I wanted to tell you a little bit about a different type of <laughs> cremation, which is water cremation, or the I call it the fancy term is alkaline hydrolysis. And so that is, um, the next slide is the picture of our um, water cremation vessel. Um, we place the body in this vessel with 12 to 13 gallons of warm water, just like a, a bath, and um, some alkaline chemicals. And then we close it and the, the vessel rocks gently for three to four hours while the um, chemicals and the warm water um, transform the body into a liquid that we call liquid essence. So we restore that water to a, a healthy and nutritious pH balance, and it comes out as a natural fertilizer. Um, it's a really potent fertilizer. One human body can fertilize a 600 acre flower farm for a year. So it's a really way to nurture the earth back. Um, so the bones are then dried and put through a cremulator and you, the family receives ashes just like you would the flame cremation. Ours are cre creamy color. Um, this, I brought some liquid essence so you could see it. It's not particularly pretty. It's like wheat coffee or strong tea. Um, but this, a little dropper full in, uh, or some drops in a gallon of water will water your house plants. So a lot of our families take home a small container for themselves. But most people don't need enough to fertilize a 600 acre flower farms. We donate the rest to nature preserves and flower farms uh, in the community. Um, the next, oh, I was going to tell you also about the water cremation. A lot of people ask me, what if you have an artificial hip or, uh, you know, things like that, which a lot of us get extra extra hardware as we age. And um, so that is recycled with medical recycling. So there's nothing is wasted. There uh, uses about 10% of the energy of a flame cremation to heat the water. Um, and there are no carbon emissions. So it's definitely a more ecologically friendly way to, um, for your body to go. So, um, and then we have the most buzzed about thing that we do right now is body composting. It's also called natural organic reduction. Um, it has been in the news. You may have seen, how many of you have seen something in the news about body composting? So I wanted to tell you a story about a 42-year-old man named Andy who um, had cancer. He died. He, he wanted to be composted. Um, and so at the end of that process, um, you're talking about giving things at a service that remind people that she had a, his wife had a ceremony. They planted a tree in a park in Arvada in his honor with his soil and then gave away jars of soil to everyone who, who wanted them, who came and they could take part of him home with them to nourish their own plants. Um, so it's a it's a really interesting and amazing process. This is a this is our chrysalis vessel, and um, you can see it kind of tipped right there. Well, down in the bottom left, you can see it. The, so we layer um, organic materials in the bottom, lay the body on again, uh, and I'll tell you more about ceremony in just a minute. But um, and then layer on top, we cover it with a proprietary compost tea. Um, and then monitor it for three to four months while the transformation takes place. Um, this is a 22-year-old woman who wanted us to use her um, soil to show people what a beautiful, um, so this is an actual um, part of a woman. It actually makes three wheelbarrows full of soil, one human body. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, we also do a laying in um, ceremony. What I told you about Andy, I jumped my notes a little bit, but the 42 year old, that was a laying out ceremony. So it's like when the soil is completed, the transformation is done, then a ceremony to celebrate 
him being returned to the earth to nourish it. And that family walks down to that tree every often and they decorate it for every occasion. Mm -hmm. The Christmas, his birthday, it's probably decorated right now for Easter. Um, and so it's a wonderful way for his wife and daughter to celebrate his life and to remember him as well. So this is a laying, a, it's a mock-up of a laying in ceremony. There's not a body in there, but what we would do is put the body on top of the layers of organic material and then family and friends can flowers, love notes, the same thing. Any organic material can be placed in with a beer, whatever, <laughs> placed in the vessel. And then um, we rotate it um, periodically during the process. Um, you're welcome to look in here. There's a little skeleton in here on some organic material. But if you rock it, it will dump out. So just be careful. Of it. Um, I love the body composting process. This is why I've chosen for myself um, because I love the idea of going back in to nourish the earth. Again, we donate whatever the family does not take um, to flower farms and nature preserves in the area. Um, I was going to read my notes to you. I haven't even looked at them. <laughs> um, so I wanted to switch gears right here so we can go to the next slide and think about, you know, I wonder what if uh, you ever thought, man, I wish I could plan in advance and kind of set things up. So that's what I want to talk to you about now. So the first uh, part of that is, and Felicia talked about some of this too, is just decide what you want. Um, there are a lot of options, including the traditional options of flame cremation or uh, just a standard or traditional ceremony with a casket. You have all of those options. And so decide kind of what you would like to do. And um, you may have other options that we haven't talked about, depending on your traditions or your heritage or culture. Um, all of those, we have had open fire cremations on out in the in a field with families who wanted that. So again, we will do whatever is within our power to do so that you can uh, do what you want. Um, so if you choose the natural funeral for your death care, um, we would meet together to discuss those choices and your plan. Um, if you want to pay in advance, the, the beauty of paying in advance to me is that it locks in a price. Um, so I don't plan on dying for another 40, 50 years, <laughs> so, but I would love to pay the current price. And so I have locked in that price by going ahead and, and prepaying. Um, and so we work, the natural funeral, all funeral homes do this. They work with an insurance com company who the Federal Trade Commission requires that the money that you pay be set aside in a, in a life insurance um, a specific life insurance policy that is set aside to pay for your death care. Um, so we can't put the money in our account until we've actually done the, the service. Um, and so uh, it locks in the price. You can check that box off your list. Um, you can save your family a lot of decision-making and a lot of scrambling at, uh, at your time of death. And um, you also, depending on your age and your health, you could pay over time. And that sometimes fits well with people's budgets. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to work that. And um, we also would gather information from you for your death certificate. Um, I've seen families, including my own, um, try to remember mom's dad's middle name you know, things like that that you need for your death certificate. So we can keep all of that on file um, to, you know, so that it relieves your family from that burden. Um, oh, I'm just, I just forgot to measure it. What if you prepay and then something new comes along and you'd rather have that done and it maybe it's just a good thing? You, if you, that's another thing about the, did you hear her question? And so and we'll take some more questions at the end too, but if you, if you prepay and your funds are set aside in this insurance policy, she was asking, but what if you change your mind or something else comes along? You know, what if there's a new disposition that comes along that's even better than water cremation or, or 
any of these things I've talked about that are ecologically friendly. So what, you know, what happens then? Or what if you move to be near your kids or something and you don't live in Colorado anymore? Those funds are there for whatever funeral home you use to draw from that time of need. The difference is, is the price isn't locked in. So that funeral home has the option of, of um, adhering to the contract that you made with um, the funeral home you started with or not. But those funds are there to go towards that no matter where you are. So that's another nice, nice thing about it. Um, sorry, I forgot to tell you that we can slip through the slides. So that your money's set aside and it's protected. See how safe it is? <laughs> <laughs> and it gives you peace of mind. You lock in that price and then your family knows what you want as well. So while you can, while you're healthy, while you're thinking clearly, all of that, you can make your own decisions and it's kind of empowering when there's so many things surrounding death that are out of, out of our control, right? Um, so I wanted to tell you, my mom died in January um, and she had pre-planned and prepaid. I think, I think she paid like $5,000 and she had the whole big traditional thing. So I don't know how much money she saved by locking in that price whenever she did this, but she, um, the beauty, there were so many things that were beautiful about that. One, we knew what she wanted. The next was, we didn't talk about that at the end of her life. We didn't say, mom, what songs do you want? Mom, what do you want to do? What, how do you want, where's your money for this? What's that? You know, we didn't, we talked about how much we loved her and how much we appreciated her. And we just loved on her. And we were able to set, just that be our goal. Um, and so it was, it was wonderful. Um, we knew what she wanted. The one thing we forgot is that she had said, when I die, look in the top drawer of the filing cabinet. <laughs> we forgot that part. Um, and so after we got back, um, the funeral home she used uh, did not have all of her best information. So when we got back, we're like, oh, that was granddaddy's middle name. You know, mom had it all right there for us. So um, God, what, all three of us and none of us thought to open the drawer and do what she's told us for years to do. But, um, but it spared us from a ton of very difficult decisions to make during a very difficult time. And it was a difficult time for us. And we knew it was coming. We knew for a long time. She was 92. She had, you know, it was all of those things were just like natural. So if you have a, <coughs> death that's not planned, that's quick, that's you know traumatic, anything like that, your family's going to be enormously more stressed and more things. So this, to me, is a lovely final gift that you can leave to those left behind. Um, so, yeah. now time for questions. Yeah, any questions? Yes. Uh, all the methods you talked about, could you price them? Not, not exactly price, but what's the most expensive and what's the cheapest of all these? All these methods of the things at the natural funeral. Um, yeah, you know. So, um, so we and we do offer flame cremation. We don't do it. We have a partner funeral home that actually does the process. So that that would be twenty four hundred dollars up to. Um, depending on what additional things you want, $10,000. It's plus. It could be plus. So if you die and you're on vacation in Europe, there's costs associated with bringing your body back, all those kinds of things. Um, and those things we don't know ahead of time. But that's kind of our general. Our price uh, list is also on our website. Um, I didn't... I was going to tell you. some of you picked these up. I noticed, but there are there's a little packet of information here that's out on the table. This is my card. If you have any other questions, I mean, this just brochures about the different um, dispositions that we offer, and then we have this beautiful funeral planning guide. And so this is something you can write. Uh, it has a lot of information about the dispositions in here, and then also places for you to write notes about. Um, other 
things that you want to happen or you want your, your family to know. Um, that's helpful. And those are out on the table. She said cremation is probably the cheapest and composting would be somewhere in the middle. Composting would be the most expensive. And the reason is it's a process of se over several months. Yeah. Can I, can I throw in a question? Yeah. Our first session, we asked people to see what was on their minds. And we would like to know how long it's possible. Well, from the two-part question, how long is it possible to be with your loved one at home after they die? Like, do we have to call immediately? Do we have a few hours? What's that time frame? And then also, could you just gently kind of pick apart what we're allowed to do for ourselves? Like Felicia's dad said, I want to transport the body, which in this whole process, I know we can have a few off and do everything, but can we also Thank you for the, both those questions. They're great. You can keep the body at home for days. Um, we've had families who who have traditions that where they the body stays at home for three days, um, and uh, and we will come and bring uh, dry ice and different things to, to assist with that, or we'll come the first time and then teach family how to how to continue this process. Um, whatever the family chooses. Again, it's like we'll do as much or as little as is needed. But yes, you can keep the, the body at home for uh, days. Um, and then you, I love your story about your dad saying, no, we want to do this. So be brave about what you want because um, if not, the the funeral home will just do it. We we don't. We ask all those questions because we want it to be what you want. But you can do everything. I mean, except you may not have a vessel to do the water cremation. But you can you can bring the body to us. We can come get it. You can buy your own flowers. We can do that for you. You can have a ceremony done by your pastor, or we could curate one for you. You can. You know, whatever you want, say. Um, and uh, we will do, at the natural funeral anyway, we do our best to um, have you do it. There are not requirements. There's not a requirement to be embalmed. There's not a requirement to be embalmed to cross state lines. If you are out of state when you pass and you need to come back, um, the only state that requires embalming to go over the state lines is Alabama. In the rest of the states in the United States, there, that's not a that's in this summer. Now I don't know if you do this, but my daughter had her dog uh, water cremation. But where do, where do they do that? I, mean, I will say that there are many dog. of us in that first picture who would love to do that. <laughs> we don't at this time, but there are places, and I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I have to. Do. I didn't even know about it until about a week after the dog died. I was so upset. Oh, so, oh maybe no. <laughs> um, if you choose to have to donate your body at death, like on my license, then you pick up from that hospital or um, what am I like I, donate your body to science? Yes. Um, so if you donate your whole body to science, then it would just go to the the, um, the organization that you choose for that. Um, and then uh, it's my understanding that after they um, done what they do, then they do a flame cremation and the and the cremains are returned to your family so, uh, several months later. Yeah, and there's no charge with that. If you donate, um, we've had people who have donated skin or an organ or something to that effect, then the body would go to that and the, that organ would be harvested. It could be harvested in our receiving room or it could be harvested at the hospital or, and then, and then we take the body and do whatever disposition. I want to thank you for that. So we have in Colorado a handful of organizations where you can leave your body if you want your whole body donated to science. Most of them ask that you start that process before death. So if that's something you're interested in, I can help you with that later. Um, I have left 
uh, some of these folders out there. This is an organization that I know of called Meaning and Donation. Um, they worked with a lot of patients of mine um, who had it, in fact, made those records those preparations through Fran and still, they allowed their family to do that. So if you are interested in learning more about them or about any of those organizations, you can talk to me or Alex. Um, and you, if you're really interested in taking one of these, please do because we have several. And uh, like Becky said, if you if you want any part of you donated, a living donation, that would be organ or tissue or ice, the best way to make sure that that's done is when you go to get your driver's license or your other form of identification, just mark that. That really works. I know when I used to do that, I would think, what? That's easy. You know, you have my driver's yeah, license yeah. and they're hard on it. I don't know. In the hospital, you are in a registry and, and it works that you will be found. And um, <laughs> I like to give a little tip for that because someone else said they want to be seen my pulmonary artery, so I am super happy. But, um, <laughs> that, and that's to let you know that for those of you whose loved one passes and they're not on life support because on life support, we can do live organ donations, right? And raise more. If that's not the case, still there's lots and lots of gifts to be made. So mine did not happen that way. Tissue can happen uh, no matter what. So these are just things to think about, but that little bit on your driver's license does work, I promise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Felicia. So um, if I just have it, an Episcopal church funeral service that was here, does any part of uh, my remains have to be present for the funeral? So I could be washing away some <laughs> <laughs> and, and you And I would add to that, you don't have to be, your body would not have to be involved to be here. So if you, or if your family wanted your body to be here, and that was your wishes too, then that also. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is it time? Last question. Last, last question. question. But not the last question, just the last question for this moment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my brother in law passed away. Um, he was cremated, but his family wanted the ashes spread in the Pacific Ocean. To do that, they had to contact a foundation which determines whether or not the pH of the water will change or the salinization or whatever scientific uh, name there might be. And they have to wait some period of time to extend his ashes uh, off the, the uh, stern of the boat. But are there organizations, because surely when you're spreading something like ashes, even soil and so on, the pH or the components of the soil change. And I wondered if there are organizations or if there are other foundations that determine that uh, because it changes nature. We have had ours tested um, by a, a researcher in the uh, University of Washington, um, and it is. Uh, nutritious to the soil. Um, so it is it puts back into and benefits um, the earth. So I I don't know if there are the same with our liquid essence. I don't know if there are organizations like that. I do know that if you are wanting to scatter remains like in a river, say you want to go up into uh, a river up in the mountains and, and release it, um, you know, the you are supposed to get permission from the state. Um, you also, if you want to do a green burial on your property, you need to get a permit. And that way, if someone ever digs up something, there's no one accused of, of murder or they don't start an investigation, you know, but it's uh, that type of thing. So there are some regulations. Colorado is pretty loose with regulations, thankfully. And so, um, I, so I'm not sure about the answer to your question. It sounds like your um, do your relatives sounds like they did the. If we find something, we'll add it to the FAQ. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 California obviously mm -hmm. would be lucky. And <laughs> New York, yeah. my husband is a minister, yeah. and so he was in charge of many, many funerals. And there were <laughs> in Kentucky, there were lots of people that wanted their ashes scattered 
on the racetrack. <laughs> now, he wasn't in charge of that, actually, for him. <laughs> but it was illegal, but it was always done. <laughs> I think that's uh, troubling there. I've heard of hikers who just put a little hole in the back of their backpack with the cranes in the middle of the hiking. Oh, we yeah. definitely didn't do that with my mom. No, I just didn't. I don't know what you <laughs> Did you both? I think we're at time there. Um, Felicia, I think you're going to be outside to keep answering questions. We've also moved the book outside. So if you haven't had a chance to look at the resources, we invite you to linger as long as you want. And please fill out a survey so that we can um, just be gathering. What we're going to do is put as many of these resources as we can on the website, including questions like that that we didn't get answered to. Um, maybe some of the resources on things like medical aid and dying that we didn't touch at all. So there will be a lot more coming, especially with the help of the what you want from your survey. So linger and we'll uh, end in music and silence as always. But big, big round of applause for Betsy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was basically just our wrap up. Um, we are so grateful for each of you for participating. Thank you, especially. I just want to emphasize for the questions that you put in on the first day. It was like a moving experience to read those. And we just want to recognize that um, some of those questions were answered during our session, so we're grateful for that. Some of those questions felt really big, uh, like the questions we ended up looking at first season. And I'm again grateful that we have the space here to ask those questions and ponder them. Um, some of the questions haven't been answered, and so that's what you've been hearing about the ways we'd like to continue the conversation. So we will be posting the sessions online after a little curation and editing. Uh, we do want to have some kind of QA online in some kind of form. And then also the final survey you've been hearing about if there's an area of resources that you'd like to hear more about, if there are additional questions questions you'd like to add. And then also, most importantly, we have an email on there, which would be a great first point of contact if you have a need for conversation or resources. So thank you all for being here. Is there anything else to add to the wrap-up? Okay. We'll move the donuts up. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have, I think it means doing a spiritual practice now. So again, we'll, if we could, we can hold this space for quiet and contemplation and um, the conversations and questions. I think we should have a hand for all of you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to end with the same practice we started with the very first time. You do not have to remember. I'll walk you through it. This is a breathing practice. The books on our exhalation, which is the last thing each of us will do, is exhale. Um, for you who are interested in neuroscience, actually focusing on your exhalation and extending it helps you calm down. So if you ever need this throughout your day, it's so helpful. If you need the opposite, if you need a little bit, focus on your inhalation. But right now we're going to focus on the exhalation. Um, I created this practice at the time of desperation, and it really helps me. I use it every single day. Uh, <coughs> technical name, theological name, is called the breath of kenosis. And, um, <laughs> I also call it the breath of surrender. Some of you told me you are not comfortable with that word. I would invite you, if you're not comfortable with that word, maybe follow, figure out why that is. Um, <laughs> if you don't want to use the word, when I guide you to use that word, it's whatever you like, obviously. Okay, so we're gonna go, I'm gonna walk us through the practice. And then I'll say amen. You know you have a, you want to go out and ask a question. That's a good time to kind of quietly get up and go. But we, at that point, we will play us lovely music, and Lori will play a slideshow of all of those images we had at the very beginning, our death images. So if you want to sit in a space and um, really soak in and kind of metabolize some a little bit of what we've begun to talk about together, that's a good place to do that. And also, um, we don't know yet how, but this is ongoing. This is ongoing individually, um, but we also think that this is ongoing collectively. So closing your eyes or just having a soft focus in front of you to bring your attention inward. First thing we do is just 
Notice, what does it feel like to be in your precious body in this moment? Next, draw your attention to your breath. What does it feel like to breathe in this moment? Now turn your focus to those exhalations, your out breaths. Don't change them at first, just notice. What does breathing out feel like in this precious body in this time? Gently extend your exhalations just a tad. Do not force anything. Just try to extend each exhalation a little bit. If you're able, at the bottom of that exhalation, pause for a brief Each time you exhale, to see if you can pause. And then allow these next in breath to come. Step is to add a phrase internally. As you exhale, you might say, I surrender, I release, I let go, whatever works for you. Having an internal phrase to add. Those of you who want to stay in this place, please, please feel free to do so. Those of you are complete, bringing your attention back to your physical form, releasing the breathing practice, feeling your feet on the floor, feeling your bum in your chair. Amen. So
Requiem 